Good morning and happy Christmas Sunday to you. I think I can speak for Elizabeth when I say how wonderful it was to see so many of you and your families here uh, for the Christmas Eve service. And in case you haven't already noticed, I want to remind you that at churches everywhere, and certainly at Creekside, we're going to be celebrating the gift of Jesus Christ every Sunday of the year. This should never feel like a chore to us. Uh, I hope we never lose track of how much of a privilege it is for us to be able to do that. The beginning of Advent was four Sundays ago, and it marked the beginning of the Christian year. The Christian year goes from Advent, which begins in late November or early December, and goes through the following November and ends with the Reign of Christ or Christ the King Sunday. Along with that Christian year, the church has developed a three-year cycle of readings called the lectionary. Those years, strangely enough, are called year A, year B, and year C. We just started year C. And year C, we focus, we will be focus, each year focuses on one of the Gospels and then incorporates readings from the other Gospels and from the Old and the New Testament. Year C, which we just started, the Gospel is the Gospel of Luke. This is good news, literally, because Gospel means good news. Uh, but it's good news for me as a preacher because Luke is probably my favorite gospel. I know that the New Life Sunday School class has been studying Luke for some time, so they could probably share some stories too. But I tell you this because uh, the material from our reading from Luke 2 today appears nowhere else in the Bible. It's unique to Luke. And it gives us a glimpse of an answer to a question that I bet many of you have wondered about. That question is, what was Jesus like when he was a kid? There are plenty of legends and miracle stories about Jesus' childhood, but this account from Luke 2 is the only one that we have in the biblical canon. It's interesting for a number of reasons, but this morning I want us to think about it, particularly how it pertains to gifts and how we share those gifts in the church. Now, I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands, but I'm assuming that most of you got some kind of gift for Christmas this year. If you're under the age of 20, or maybe 30, the gifts which are important to you are likely to be commodities. That is, stuff that you want. Things like toys, clothes, electronics, housewares, things that you can actually wrap up and put under a Christmas tree. Did anybody have stuff like that at their house this Christmas? I figured. When I was a kid, I used to hear people at my church say things like, I don't want any presents for Christmas this year. I just want to have all my family home. And I would think to myself, wow, that person is really old. <laughs> how, how sad is that to not get any presents for Christmas? How terrible is that to not even be able to think of anything that you want more than your family, for heaven's sakes. Well, brothers and sisters, I am here to tell you that I am on my way to becoming that old person. <laughs> what I have found is increasingly the things that I want, and there are plenty of things that I want. Uh, but increasingly, they're not things that can be wrapped up and put under a tree. Maybe this is the wisdom that comes with maturity, but I have to tell you, life was actually simpler when what I wanted was stuff. Anybody with money can buy stuff. The other things that we want tend to get a little bit more complicated. 
Let me give you an example. David Gilliland was here to play piano for our Christmas Eve service. It's always a pleasure to work with him and hear him play. And as a thoroughly mediocre pianist myself, I inevitably find myself at some time in the evening thinking, man, I wish I could play like that. But there's a pretty big difference between wishing for something and working to make it happen. In order to actually play like that, I'd have to spend hours a day practicing, lots of evenings in rehearsal. I'd have to spend a lot of years and a whole lot of money on graduate degrees. See, even with a lot of talent, developing a skill takes a lot of work. I'd have to sacrifice a whole lot of things that I currently do that I actually enjoy. So it turns out that if someone could wave a magic wand and make me talented and skilled, I'd be okay with that. But when it comes right down to it, I'm not willing to commit to working that hard or giving up that much. See, there's a big difference between wishing and working. As I said earlier, the Bible doesn't tell us very much about Jesus' childhood. We aren't told about that progression from toddler to teacher, from rug rat to rabbi, from munchkin to messiah. <laughs> I think we can assume that as the Son of God, Jesus had a special aptitude for this calling. In a more contemporary reference, we might say that the force was strong within him. But Jesus was human. And I think that part of Jesus' humanity was that he had to grow up and learn and work like everyone else. There wasn't a divine shortcut by which Jesus magically became wise and mature and knew a whole lot about Jewish law and Jewish teaching. We know that Jesus was all of these things by the time he began his ministry, so I think we can assume that he spent long hours in study and dialogue about the law. We know that he practiced prayer in his ministry. I bet that didn't just happen. Even people with extraordinary gifts have to work to develop them. That's one of the lessons that I take from this story from Luke. Now, 12 years old is a significant age for a Jewish boy. It's the last year of his childhood. Shortly after his 13th birthday, a young man becomes bar mitzvah. That literally means son of the commandment. And what this meant in Jewish culture was that the boy was now responsible for his own actions. As a child, his parents would take responsibility for him. But the transition to manhood meant that his choices and their consequences were his own and no one else's. This explains in part, I think, Jesus' response to his mother when she says, Child, why have you treated us like this? We were searching for you in great anxiety. Now, notice that Mary addresses Jesus as child, but Jesus responds as an adult. No apology for the inconvenience or worrying his parents, just, why were you searching for me? Didn't you realize that I must be in my father's house? It must have been a bittersweet moment for Mary, the realization that her son was nearly grown. Of course, since the beginning of her pregnancy, she knew that he was marked for a special purpose. She must have been bursting with pride to see him sitting in the temple, talking and asking questions and listening to the rabbis. 
her precocious 12-year-old must have spent a lot of time reading and studying Torah to have the wisdom and the confidence to speak to the most respected leaders of his community. He was standing on the threshold of manhood, but he returned to Nazareth with his parents and was obedient to them. And then Luke adds this lovely benediction at the end of chapter 2 in verse 52. He says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and years and in divine and human favor. I think this is the whole point of Luke's story about the 12-year-old Jesus in the temple. So that we can get a glimpse of this child who is favored by God for a special purpose and a sense of Jesus growing and maturing into the teacher and the savior whom he was to become. I think there are some lessons which we at Creekside need to be reminded of. As followers of Jesus, we are called to glow with the same divine wisdom and favor that Jesus embodied. Last week I talked about our mission as bearers of Christ, people who show the light of Christ to the world. This Wednesday, the church board is going to meet for a retreat to consider our goals and goals that our ministry teams have turned in for 2016. I know there are things that we all wish for this congregation. To keep serving our community, to witness to God's love, to invite new people into our family of faith, to incorporate more families and children into our congregation. I could go on with a list like that, and I bet that most of you would agree with the things that I have on my list. But there's a difference between wishing and working. I believe this congregation has been blessed with a wide variety of gifts. And we have some really nice stuff. This facility, our property, the things that we have worked to put on it. But if we focus exclusively on the stuff, and its maintenance and preservation, we risk losing sight of the mission to which God is calling us. We are called to glow with the light of Christ, the light which was in the beginning and with God and through him that gives us life, the light that we have anticipated coming through Advent and that we celebrated on Christmas Eve and that we remember every Sunday. We are called to grow in wisdom, to do the intentional work of discerning what is ours to do at this time and how we can work to make those goals a reality. Instead of just wishing that things would be different, and finally, we are called to go, to go out as followers of Jesus Christ, disciples who are committed to continuing the work of Jesus for the sake of God's mission in the world. So, glow with the light of Christ, grow in wisdom and maturity, and go into the world with the good news that Christ has come and lives among us. May God bless us as we continue the work of Jesus in 2016. Amen.